Today I'm joined by Father Jim Blunt, a member of the Society of Our Lady of the Trinity and promoter of the Flame of Love movement, internationally known for his ministry of healing and exorcism. Father Jim Blunt came all the way from the Diocese of Atlanta, Georgia, United States, to Hungary to remind the nation that in today's seething world, the Central European country has a special mission. Father Jim Blunt, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Welcome back to Hungary. Thank you. <laughs> I love Hungary and I love EWTN. Okay, <laughs> that's a great start. <laughs> yeah. Well, Father, this is your third time within a year uh, that you, you came back to, to Hungary. Why, why do you keep saying yes to these invitations? Well, I belong to a community that's dedicated to the Virgin. Mm -hmm. We're called the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And we are a group of men, and we also have holy nuns, who are completely consecrated to the Virgin. We love her. And Hungary belongs to the Virgin. She belongs to the Virgin Mary as well. So there's a natural relationship or affinity between my community and Hungary. We are sons and daughters of Mary, and so are you. And it's the highest possible honor to have as our mother, the mother of Jesus Christ, is our mother too. She loves Hungary, she loves Hungary, and she loves Saint Stephen, who coronated her or crowned her. So I believe that Hungary still belongs to Our Lady. It still belongs to the Virgin. And I sense her presence very strongly around here. And I know she wants to preserve Hungary from any possible dangers, visible or invisible. So I'm her priest son, hmm. and I work for Mary. I don't receive a salary, I don't receive a stipend. I have no money at all, but I have God. I have God because of Jesus and Mary, and I want to serve them. And I know they send me here to Hungary to help bring the graces of the Holy Spirit, especially through the flame of love, so that Hungary can be preserved from any evil or danger. Hmm. We're living in a very dangerous time. Yeah, exactly. Well, you mentioned the flame of love, and last August, I believe, in 2022, you were here, and that was, I think, the first time this year when you visited, and you spoke at the, the flame of love uh, festival. So, how did you how did you first hear about this movement, the flame of love movement, and why do you think it's so popular now these days in, in the United States? Well, I've always been intrigued with um, the spiritual life with the mystical life. And when I was growing up, I would just read the lives of the saints. That was my reading material. There's nothing more, um, you might say, intelligent or wise than the writings of the saints, and nothing more beautiful and nothing more powerful. So the saints, men and women both, they moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God would give them special revelations and so naturally, when Our Lord and Our Lady gave to a beautiful, humble, Hungarian woman named Elizabeth Kendelman, another special revelation for our time, I was intrigued. Mm -hmm. Anything that comes from Jesus and Mary has my heart. I don't care what it is. If it's from Jesus and Mary and approved by the church, I'm on it. And I saw these revelations. I read about them. I was intrigued. But I'm a very busy priest, and I already have uh, several mystical revelations that I'm reading, studying, and working with. I wasn't sure quite how to fit this in, or if to fit it in, in my own ministry. And I was converted, so to speak, when I visited my elderly aunt in Philadelphia, my Aunt Catherine. She's a saint. She had 15 children. Wow. She oozed love. She oozed holy love. And I loved her. And I would see my Aunt Catherine every time I would preach in that area of Philadelphia. I would stop by and visit her out of courtesy, but also out of love. Now, I usually would stay with my aunt a day or two if I had the time in my, in my missions. We would pray the rosary together. And I noticed that my Aunt Catherine, we called her Cassie, my Aunt Cassie, when we would pray the rosary, she would add some of the flame of love prayers at the end of each decade. Really interesting. What, when was this? Was it the uh, 1980s about? Yeah, I first noticed it with Aunt Catherine, I would say 1980s, 1990s, just a tiny bit. That's amazing. And then as a priest, I noticed it more in the 2000s and 2010s. More and more I noticed this, and it, it got my attention because I was praying to the good Lord to give me a sign. 
whether I should integrate this new spirituality, which is completely approved by the Holy Catholic Church. And if, if God goes to the trouble to give it to the church, we should go to the trouble to find out what it is. Because God always does things in a purposeful manner. God is not arbitrary. He's not arbitrary. God is purposeful. So if God goes to the trouble to send this amazing gift through this beautiful woman, Elizabeth Kinderman, whom I believe is saintly, I think she's saintly. Perhaps she should be canonized one day. But she suffered a lot for this gift. Then we need to study it and find out what it is and why. And so I asked God for a sign. My Aunt Catherine was using it. And I said, hmm, if this holy woman is using this prayer, there's something here. I better wake up. And you see, we, we priests have to be alert to the laity. We don't know everything. Right. We have to be humble men. And God will speak to the, to the clergy through the laity, even sometimes through teenagers. And so that was my sign. I began to read up on it and was most especially intrigued with the unity prayer, the promise that our Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be his name, gave to Elizabeth. That when we would say this beautiful and awesome prayer, he would immediately come down into the situation and blind Lucifer and paralyze him. Now, I'm an exorcist, and I've worked in this ministry even before I was a priest. Dominic, before I was your age, I worked in this wow. ministry, part of an exorcism team. So for more than 40 years, and I've seen things that you wouldn't believe what I've seen. But I will tell you this, Jesus always wins. The Lord always wins, especially if the priest has recourse to the Blessed Virgin Mary too. And so having learned the unity prayer and seeing the promise, and the promise itself is approved, the promise itself has an imprimatur, that this prayer will bind and blind the evil spirits. I've had a situation at my own chapel that suddenly made it possible to test this prayer. And what happened was after a daily mass at my chapel in Georgia, a woman, a visitor, a guest, stood up at the very end of Holy Mass and began to what we call manifest. She began to show signs of an evil spirit. And her eyes rolled back in her head. And she began to scream in a very unusual language. It was not a normal human language. So, so to speak, a demonic language? Like a demonic language. Mm. Yeah, it was very creepy. and gave you a creepy sensation when you would hear it. Like what you would see probably in these scary movies, I assume. Something like that. And sometimes in, in full-blown exorcisms, it might speak a strange tongue. Now, there is a holy gift of tongues. It's in the Holy Bible. And every Catholic, every Christian should be open to that gift of holy tongues. It's a beautiful gift. It increases all the other gifts when you use it. But this is an evil tongue, and has a strange feeling about it, and an illogic about it. And she did many other strange things as well, flailing her hands and screaming and foaming at the mouth. It was really something. But you see, Satan, he cannot stand the presence of the Holy. And so whether it's the Holy Mass, or the Holy Eucharist, a Holy Priest, or a Holy Nun, or for instance, a Holy Relic. I keep the Relic of the True Cross with me at all times. Do you think is that the, the most powerful relic that is present, you know, in, in some churches? And, and I know some, uh, some priests also have the sort of the, a piece from, from the, the Holy, the, from the True Cross. Yeah. Well, I tell you, all first class relics are powerful. For example, if you had a little piece of the bone of Pope John Paul the Great, mm. the demon will scream on that one too. So any first class relic is going to be very, very powerful. The Eucharist most of all, the Eucharist is more than a relic, it's the body and blood of the God-man present to us. So in an exorcism, we don't normally use the Eucharist close to the person possessed because they scream and go crazy when the Eucharist gets close to them. To protect the sanctity of the Eucharist, we have to keep the Lord in a tabernacle close by to keep him safe. But yes, the relic of the true cross is one of the most powerful in the world. It brings healing and deliverance. I touched a blind man in Lithuania a few months ago. He now sees with 20-20 vision. Wow. He was touched with this. His vision has come back. We've seen many, many miracles. It's also a great protection and also a great test for the unclean spirits. This woman was out of control. And I didn't have time to call the good bishop and ask for permission to do an exorcism. And I didn't do an exorcism without permission. So what I did was, well, hmm, I remember 
I just memorized the unity prayer from Elizabeth Kindleman from Budapest. <laughs> I said, well, the promise is, and the promise is approved, it will blind and paralyze evil spirits. Let's give it a try. My dad was a lawyer and a judge and a scientist. And my daddy taught us always to test things carefully and logically. Like said, St. Paul said it in Bible. See? So I thought, well, this is a, <laughs> my perfect opportunity. This is like dropping in my lap. Let me just give this a little test. So I asked my team to surround this poor lady who was out of control. And the whole church was there watching. This was actually a miracle viewed by more than 75 people. It was a public miracle. And I had my team say the prayer after me line by line. And Dominic, if you don't mind, I'm going to say it now. Yeah, in fact, I would love to, to pray it with you, yes? Okay. I'll say it line by line, just like we did in my church. If you could answer, it's so beautiful that even now, over the air, it will bind and blind anything evil approaching our viewers. It's so filled with grace. So it goes like this. My adorable Jesus... My adorable, My adorable Jesus. Jesus. May our feet journey together. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our hearts beat in, in unison. unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together. May our lips pray together. To gain mercy from the Eternal Father. To gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? That's a beautiful prayer. It's I've read it in Hungarian, but I've never heard it in, in, in English. I don't know which is more beautiful. Yeah. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. But I have to say, when I was in, a, in Denver, Colorado, in the Archdiocese of Denver, I came across, you know, in one of the, the Adoration Chapels, the diary of Elizabeth Kindleman, and I said, wow, I, I've, I've known this book, and I was so happy. It seems like in the U.S., it really did gain ground. Yeah. It's ironical. It's um, God's holy way of acting that the gift was given here to Budapest, to Hungary. It was transferred to South America where it grew. It was then brought to the U.S. where it is flourishing. And now we're bringing it back to Hungary, <laughs> full grown. And I dare to say that beautiful Hungary does not yet know the pearl of great price that has been given to her through this gift this prayer and the other prayers in the diary itself. It's a pearl of great price. And isn't it funny, a missionary has to come from America back to Hungary to awaken the beautiful Hungarian people to this beautiful prayer that comes from the beautiful virgin. It's kind of ironic, it's kind of <laughs> beautiful, you know? It is. But I would say, Hungary, you don't know the treasure you have. You are multi-millionaires, not in pagan money, but in spiritual wealth. Hungary has the prayer from heaven that will save the world. Hmm. She has the prayer that will save the world. The unity prayer and the little insert prayer to the Hail Mary. And so we use this prayer in my chapel unexpectedly. And this woman, who seemed to be fully possessed by demons, immediately was released in front of us in 60 seconds. Hmm. And the time it took us to say this prayer, she was free. Wow. She knelt on the ground in front of me, put her hands in a prayerful position, and bowed like a little lamb, asking for my blessing. And I took her back to the sacristy, just to make sure that she really was free. She was. Since then, I've noticed that there were four other exorcists in Europe who've had the same experience that I've had. With the unity prayer. With the unity prayer. Almost, almost identical experience. Mm. Now it's spreading across the U.S. to the exorcist priests in the U.S. This is a gift we need because John Paul the Great himself said, John Paul not only was a man with several doctorate degrees, but a man of imminent sanctity. He said that mankind, and that includes Hungary, is now involved in the greatest battle between the word and the anti-word, between the Christ and the antichrist between light and darkness, 
since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. We are in quite a battle now, quite a battle. And we need the big weapons now. And God has fashioned for the church new weapons to bring victory to Hungary and to the world. Well, you, you mentioned about this, you talked about this battle last August at, at the same festival that we were just talking about. You said, I saw an army dressed in black, armed and equipped, attacking Hungary and entering its territory. The spiritual background of this army is the same as of that of communism and its advanced successors in the world today. Can you, can you speak to that vision that you just had? Yes, God gives his people visions in order to alert them, to awaken them, to protect them of what could happen, you see, if we don't respond accordingly. And so we see like with Jonah the prophet that he was given a message to warn the people, right, of, of Nineveh. They responded, hmm. and so they were not destroyed. The same thing with Hungary, that I could actually see the, the enemy coming across the borders in the middle of a mass, unexpectedly, not even praying for that, I saw them. And Our Lady made me realize this is the danger that Hungary is in. But she loves Hungary. Hungary is like her, her children. She doesn't want this to happen. We would be, I would say, what's the kindest word to use? Naive? To think that Hungary or the U.S. would be completely spared from the invasions that are occurring all over the world. Mm. No. Unless we're living for Jesus Christ in a radical manner, in other words, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving him and serving him, unless we're doing that, then there are certain doors and windows open in the country of laxity, I hate the word, but laziness, of materialism, of complacency, of self-worship. There are certain doors and windows open through which the evil spirit can enter and manipulate and control a nation. We were made, as Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So the real question is, in beautiful Hungary, are your hearts restless? Because if they're not resting in Jesus Christ, they will be restless. They won't be happy or satisfied. In the long run, though, what this means is there are certain openings in a country that does not worship the God who made her. Hungary didn't pop into existence all by itself. God made Hungary. And Jesus died for Hungary. And the Holy Spirit yearns to sanctify Hungary. Hungary was not made for itself. Hungary was made for God. And as soon as Hungary, including all the peoples of Hungary, even those who call themselves atheists, as soon as Hungary begins to worship the one true God, the complete protection and joy of the Holy Spirit would be over Hungary. So this little vision God gave me was a warning signal, a warning sign. And I've spoken to many people in Hungary about it since then. And, and I've noticed that those who are very, very prayerful, those men and women I would describe as wise and holy, they all agree. Hmm. I've noticed those who are living in medi a mediocre Catholicism, a watered-down Catholicism, a once-a-week Christianity, they tend to be blind. Indifferent. So this is definitely a warning to the country. We are in a worldwide battle now. It's all over the world, in the United States of America as well. The only answer is devotion to God, to give our hearts to the one who gave them to us to give it back to the one who made us, and to love him, that will keep Hungary safe. At the same festival, you, you mentioned that, uh, that the Hungarian people have two demons to sort of get rid of. You, you said the demon of grumbling and complaining and the demon of sadness. Uh, so how can the Hungarian people be freed from these two demons? Beautiful question, Dominic. Um, by the way, I love your saint, Saint Dominic, <laughs> saint of the rosary. I love Saint Dominic too. And though he was an exorcist too, by the way. Yeah. And you know that he could release people from the devil by simply putting the rosary around their neck. They'd be released from the devil. Hmm. That's how powerful the rosary is. And now God's given us the flame of love prayers with the rosary. It's even more powerful. But Dominic is a good example. Why? Because Dominic was a man of joy. He was a man of purity and a man of joy. And they, they go together, by the way. 
So if a country is not pure, she will never be happy. John Paul said that joy is impossible without chastity. So really what Hungary needs is purity. She needs purity so she can have joy. We need purity and joy. And I'm concerned about this because as my friends drove me here to the studio today, um, I saw uh, several women dressed extremely immodestly in a way that I would call it horrible, horrible, like short, 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 shorts. Every woman should dress like a queen. We should never dress in a way that would cause the sin of lust to rise up in your brothers. But the billboards were even worse. The billboards I saw across the city of Budapest were unbelievable. You know, many of my American friends who traveled to Hungary said exactly what you just said. Really? Yeah. It was really struck me. I was thinking, boy, wouldn't it be great if they could even have some special legislation in Budapest that no such billboards can be erected. It's okay to advertise, but you don't have to sin to advertise. You don't have to sin to advertise. In fact, God will bless your advertising business if you keep his commandments. If the business keeps the commandments of God, it will be blessed 10 times more. They'll make even more money, but you don't need to sin to make money. What happens is you end up losing your soul is what happens, but it's destroying the city as well and the young men as they walk around and see all of this inviting young men into filthy sins and even married men into adultery. It should not be. So sexual sin and immorality and immodesty brings sadness. This is the consistent teaching of the church and John Paul proclaimed it most beautifully and eloquently that without purity there is no joy. So if Hungary could make a concerted effort to pray for one or the other or both, because they go together, that would be a way to conquer sadness and grumbling, sadness and grumbling. I could even make it more childlike. I would say, Hungary, pray for joy. Pray for joy. One saint said that joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. Sin and sadness cannot coexist with joy. They can't. In fact, I noticed when I was a teenager, when I was happy, no temptation could touch me when I was happy. No temptation. But if I was sad or depressed that very day, terrible temptations would strike at me. Almost like the devil's waiting for my weak spot, you see? So joy gives us a certain strength against sin. If Hungary would begin praying for joy, I think that we should make it a goal. Let's pray that Hungary becomes the most joyful nation in Europe, the most joyful nation in the world, and perhaps she should be known as the nation of the smile. I like that. I love that. <laughs> if she'd be known for that, the sin would disappear, you see? Mm. Because let me tell you, I've seen the devil face to face. He's appeared to me on several occasions. Once when he appeared to me, he threatened to kill me. I've seen him. There's no one more miserable than Satan. No one more miserable than Satan. Here's my point. There's not a speck of joy in Lucifer. I've seen him face to face physically. There's not a speck of joy in him at all. He's the most miserable creature in the universe. And hungry, don't be like Satan. Don't be miserable or grumbly. Be joyful. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can't buy it at McDonald's. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It only comes from heaven. It comes from God. And joy changes everything. It changes everything. So we pray through the flame of love, perhaps, that hungry becomes the most joyful nation in Europe, the happiest nation in the world, and the nation of the smile. Let Hungary be a beautiful and joyful nation, just like Jesus and Mary. Whenever you, you come, you're always trying to, to first encourage, but also remind the Hungarian people of you know, what their true identity is. Compared to other nations, I mean, I'm sure God has plans with, with, with other nations as well. Why do you think Hungary is so special? Well, you know, I've noticed it's, it's evident in sacred scripture. It's evident in the workings of God through history, for instance, at Fatima, that God loves what is small. 
when he appeared at Fatima through his holy mother, think of it, he didn't appear to the president, the prime minister, or the cardinal, or the bishops. He didn't even appear to the poor priest. He appeared to children. Mary appeared to the little children, and the angel did as well. Jesus and Mary did later on. At Garabandal appeared to four little girls. Israel itself was the smallest nation in the world, and she alone had God's favor on her to this day, Israel. God loves what is small, and you and I, Dominic, priests and laymen, if we want God's favor to be on us, we have to be small. It's a great danger of becoming, you might say, famous or popular in my own line of work. I, I kind of hate it in a way, uh, because the only one who can save us is Jesus, not Father Jim. Only God can save us. And we have to be small to be worthy of God's actions in our lives. We have to be small. I think Hungary is kind of a small nation. And I think that Hungary has an inherent humility about her. An inherent humility. And so our Lord and Our Lady love Hungary. And they speak to me in my spirit, and they tell me they have chosen Hungary to be an example to all of Europe. Can I say something daring right now? Go ahead. Listen, Hungary doesn't need the European Union. The European Union needs Hungary. Hungary is the example, not the European Union. They're filled with deception. Hungary is a beautiful gift from God to the world. She has a potential for humility and for purity and for sanctity. She has a potential for dynamic Marian faith, Hungary does. God has chosen Hungary to be an example to the European Union, not vice versa. This is a beautiful country, and St. Stephen gave this country to Our Lady an extraordinary act of courage and faith and reverence and love and humility when he crowned Our Lady with his own crown. See, that was littleness. <laughs> Instead of being a big shot, he let Mary, you might say, be the big shot. Now that reminds me of Jim Caviezel's, you know, he was the, the main actor in The Passion of Christ. He said, the name Saul means little one. And, or, sorry, the main Saul means great one, and the name Paul means little one. So in order, if we want to be great, we need to be little. Amen. It, it's, it's more fun to be little. Uh, when we're, that's why prideful people are always miserable. Because they're trying to not only control uh, the world, but control everyone around them. You see, like, take the place of God. Well, we're not qualified to be God. We're not even qualified to be the God of our own life. We need God to be God. And we need to be his sons and daughters. And a certain freedom happens when we do that. Life becomes more carefree when I don't have to be God. These for you and for everyone I meet. I don't have to be. I'm your brother. I'm not your God, and I don't need to be God to myself. I think Hungary has a great potential for this, to let God be the God of Hungary. Not any man, not any governmental system, but God himself through Jesus to be the God of Hungary. So I think God has chosen Hungary because of a certain smallness, not only about her size and her population, but there's something in the spirit of the Hungarian people. We need to find it and brush it off and polish it and let it come out. This humility and this childlike faith that I believe exists in Our Lady's children, the Hungarian people. There's something there that's special. We can't let it be clouded over by the entertainment industry, by immodesty, by greed for money, and certainly not by complacency. We shouldn't be complacent. This isn't heaven. We can be complacent when we get to heaven, but not yet. We're on our way to heaven. So that's another great danger for all the countries of the world. When you don't believe in God and in heaven, you end up making this earth into heaven. And that's when terror comes. That's when terror comes. We need heaven to be heaven, God to be God, and the earth to be earth. Earth should reach up to heaven then things are brought into their proper order in our lives. This isn't heaven. This is a preparation or a, an anteroom to heaven. Let Hungary be the anteroom of the whole world to heaven. As you, you enter Hungary, you say, whoa, this must be the entrance to heaven. <laughs> Let Hungary have that role to play in the world. And you can tell immediately by the smiles of the Hungarian people. 
Well, so be it. So be it. Amen. You already have it. No. I hope so. May the, all the <laughs> hungry have the same smile that you have. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, Father Jim, you, you mentioned that, uh, and I mean, this is how Hungarians know you here and all around the world, that you're, uh, you're in the healing service, but also you're an exorcist, and you were appointed uh, as, the diocese, uh, as the exorcist of the Diocese of Atlanta. No, I'm not the exorcist. I was a di the exorcist in the Central American country of Belize. And Ah. for many, many years. And now that I have a traveling ministry, I can only do exorcisms in each diocese, for instance, this one, if that local bishop will give me permission or ask me to, which does happen um, more than I can mention, actually, is more private secret things. For instance, I was just in another diocese in the U.S. a couple months ago, and when I arrived, the bishop, his, his vicar, gave me a letter um, asking me to and endorsing me to do two exorcisms for his diocese. Okay. So wherever I am, if the bishop needs an exorcism, he can ask me, and he has to give me that permission because I travel so much. Right. Yeah. And how does, how does, you know, we, we saw pictures, we saw movies about exorcism. I'm sure we've read plenty of articles about it. But what is really the role and the duties of, of an exorcist? Well, you know, the, the most vital role, first of all, for the exorcist is to make sure that he's in a state of grace that you really can't play with the devil. No one can, actually. But in exorcism, it's even more dangerous because you're dealing with, you might say, the devil face to face. So you really can't, you can't outplay him. He's a master fabricator. You can't play with him. So you've got to be authentic. So the exorcist has to be a man of God, in love with God, staying in a state of grace, going to confession once a week, praying his rosaries every single day, so he has to be filled with the Holy Spirit. One, you might say, sold out for Jesus, just sold out for God. That's the first thing, he himself better be holy. If he has a team helping him, which he's supposed to, they better be holy too. So in other words, you can't have on your team helping you with exorcism somebody who's committing adultery or somebody who's getting you know, intoxicated every Saturday night. The devil will see those sins during the exorcism and will call them out. You'll call them out and even jump on them during the exorcism. So your team, too, has to be in a good state of grace. So those are the first two requirements that have to be there or nothing else is possible. Thirdly, we need a certain wisdom or prudence. There has to be a discernment. Not everyone who comes from ex an exorcism is actually possessed. I would say not even 10%, not even 5% of them are actually possessed. They may well have a demonic problem, and there are several levels of demonic interference, like temptation and vexation and obsession and oppression and semi-possession or partial possession and full possession. So there are levels of demonic interference. It could be one of those other lesser levels. Nevertheless, they can be strong. They can be kind of creepy, and the poor people still need to be freed from that as well. That's called a deliverance as opposed to an exorcism. But there has to be a strong discernment process to make sure that the person really does have a demon interfering with his or her life and to see what level that is at. Sometimes it could be a mental illness, too, that mimics the demonic emotional yeah, but, but, illness. But, but, thank you for mentioning that because I think there, there, there's a very little knowledge here, not just in Hungary, but just in general. You know, people confuse mental illness with someone being possessed. But really, what, what is the difference? How can you sort of distinguish between someone who's possessed and someone who has a mental illness? Yes, well, keeping in mind, too, that it's not uncommon for both to be present in the same person. For someone to be mentally ill and to be what we call demonized in some way. Why is that? Because Satan is, is the classical bully. The devil is a bully. And he will kick you when you're down. In other words, he goes for the weak, the weak prey. He, in my country, the United States of America, maybe it's true here in Hungary, I don't know yet, but he's going for the teenagers. Because they're weak and they're undefended. And they're watching things on the television, the computer, and the cell phones that open them up to the demonic. And they're not well protected. The devil goes for those who are weak. So somebody who is mentally or emotionally ill is more or less broken in some way. And through those cracks or those fissures, the devil can slide right in and control them. So just to be aware of this, I've, I've spoken to other exorcists around the world and studied uh, quite a bit as well that this is a fairly common phenomenon. So the, the two can coexist in the same person. Now, one way you would tell the difference 
One, one classical way, though, is this. We should have a psychologist or a psychiatrist or at least a licensed counselor on our exorcism team. So a professional who's experienced with psychological problems, who can help the priest discern whether this is merely psychological, uh, maybe partly psychological, maybe not psychological at all. Now, one classical way to test it is why we use the relics. If I do have someone who's presenting to me as possessed or demonized in some way, I frequently will hand them a relic without telling them what I'm doing. Because while they may be putting on a show, the devil himself, he is for real, so to speak. He's a liar, but he's truly real. And so I may say, listen, let me pray with you. Here, hold my cross. And I don't say another word, but there is a relic of the true cross here. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of miracles through this cross. If someone has a demon, they can't hold it. As soon as I get close to them, they withdraw. If I touch their hand with it, they usually will scream because it burns them. I could do the same thing with holy water. I said, well, yes, let's, let's bless ourselves first, but I'm actually doing a test. We're trying to be very gentle about the whole thing, but here, I'll bless you. You take some holy water. The minute they touch that water, they begin to burn. So these are certain supernatural signs that the problem may not be psychological. It might indeed be demonic, you see? So these are some of the tests that we can use to determine whether what's there is simply mental, emotional, or if it's also spiritual and diabolical. There are certain little tests like this that we can do. So I've heard in another interview of viewers that someone being possessed is, is different. As you, as you mentioned, there are different levels. And you said it's, it's sort of rare, right? Am I right that it's, it's sort of yes. rare for someone to be fully possessed? It's very rare. I would say, gosh, honestly, I would say maybe, maybe 1% of the cases presented to us, maybe 1%, literally, like 99, no. Of the 99, maybe four are partially possessed, maybe one is fully possessed. The others are some lower level, which is still though a serious situation, still very serious, like an obsession. Right. What if a young man comes to me or a young lady and she has this thought and almost like a voice telling her 24 hours a day, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. When she goes to bed, when she wakes up, when she's with her mom and dad at breakfast, that's a torture. It's almost worse than possession, almost worse. But it can be dealt with, you might say, slightly easier than possession. So these other levels of demonic interference can also be somewhat serious and need to be dealt with as well. And every exorcist is trained in this, but it's my belief that every Catholic priest should be trained in this as well. Perhaps not for exorcisms, no, give that to the bishop to give to the exorcist, of course. But the lower levels, any priest can deal with these things. Like prayers of deliverance? Yes. So it's certain simple prayers too. For instance, the unity prayer we just discussed a little while ago is very effective in getting rid of some demon spirits from someone. Another one I can mention right on the air because it's only one line. It was given by the Virgin Mother of Jesus Christ to a young man in Africa. It's called the Most Precious Blood of Jesus Devotion. Again, it has a complete imprimatur of the bishops in Nigeria, totally approved. This one line prayer I have found frees people from evil spirits frequently, especially demons of, of substance abuse, demons of depression and demons of suicide. I've seen countless miracles with this simple prayer. And in English, it goes like this. Most precious blood of Jesus Christ, save us and the whole world. That's the whole prayer. And the Virgin Mary, when she appeared to this teenager in Africa, who's now in the seminary studying to be a priest, when she appeared to him, she recommended that we say the prayer 500 times a day. 500 times? <laughs> do you say it 500 times a I day? I do. I said it this morning. Oh, wow. I say it on my beads. Now, Mama didn't mention the rosary, but I think she was winking her eye at us. Because if you go around your Hail Mary beads on your rosary, that's 50. So you go 10 times around your rosary with that prayer, that's 500. And usually it takes me 30 minutes, 30 minutes. I pray it for me to stay free because I deal with some very serious things. I don't want to be contaminated, you might say, by what I'm dealing with. 
but more so that that excess grace that I'm receiving is available, you might say, at my fingertips for whoever comes to me for help. I can't save anyone, but Jesus can save everyone. Well, it appears to me that you are the definition of what Jesus says, pray cons constantly, consistently. Um, is there even a, a second in the day when you don't pray? Rarely. Really, I, I'm like an infant in the mother's womb, con connected to the umbilical cord, that uh, Jesus um, and God, they, uh, how do you say this? They are my life and my love. My life and my love. It's, it bears repeating. St. Augustine said that with God himself, we are restless, Lord. We are restless until our hearts rest in thee. That God himself is our rest, our peace, our life, our joy. He is even our oxygen. Hmm. Prayer is the oxygen of a Christian. And when you fall in love with God, by the way, Dominic, prayer becomes something beautiful. It's like being with your best friend, or I understand you're engaged to be married to a beautiful young woman. And I'm sure to be around her is like, like joy, you see? It's kind of like that with God, that when you fall in love with God, just to pray is an undeserved gift. You mean, Lord, you'll listen to me? That you'll come into my presence if I just ask you? You are everything and beautiful, and I am nothing, and I am broken, and you still love me? Whoa! <laughs> I love you too. It's like that. So it becomes your everything, almost like your spouse, your best friend, your spouse, your life, your everything. And so prayer is not only the movement of your lips, but it's also this contact, this presence with God. And that's why your beautiful Budapest prayer, the unity prayer, speaks of unity between God and man. God and man being united in prayers that are spoken and even unspoken. Well, Father, a little bit switching topics here, but you mentioned that you love EWTN. And I would love to hear about the story when you, you've met with Mother Angelica and just a really special story. Can you tell our viewers? Yes, I have um, several special stories, to be honest with you, with Mother Angelica. Um, one I would share with you when I was a young novice, I was a Benedictine because I loved to pray. So when I was 19, I was a Benedictine and Mother came to my monastery, the abbey where I was a novice or a postulant. And we all met her. She was there for a charismatic conference. So Mother Angelica was really a woman of the Holy Spirit. She truly was. And every Catholic should be a man or woman of the Holy Spirit. And we met her, the novices and the postulants afterwards, we spoke with her. And I welcomed her. I said, welcome, Mother. I'm so glad you're here. And she, she stopped everything, looked at me, put her hands on my shoulder. I mean, there's a lot of us there, but she singles me out, puts her hands on my shoulders and begins to pray over me in tongues, praying over me in the Holy Spirit. When she got all done, I looked at her and she looked at me. I said, whoa, what was that about? <laughs> now, here I am on her station years later, <laughs> also preaching the gospel like she did. So the Holy Spirit must have singled me out to her eyes and she was like giving me, you might say, her blessing, so to speak. That was one encounter I had with her. And the one I think you're referring to was when Mother was in her last months of life and the team, she had a beautiful around-the-clock team helping her. She was you know, very, very sick and confined to her bed. And one day, uh, a few months before Mother died, she was um, going into, into her final agony and they thought she would be she wasn't going to last the day. She was on, on her way to heaven. And the team around her, the, the, the good priests at EWTN in Hansville, they were all out on mission somewhere, so nobody was there. So they called me in Georgia. I'm in the state right next to Alabama. And they said, Father, Mother's dying and there's no priest to anoint her. We, we needed to call you first. Can you come? Now remember, I'm three and a half hours away. Mm. But I, it's Mother Angelica, and I love her. I said, of course I will. So I, I canceled my work for the rest of that day. I think it was a Saturday afternoon. Jumped in my car. Within 10 minutes, I was off in my car and drove three and a half hours there. Got to the convent, which I see behind us there, right in that building, and went right into her quarters. 
and gave her the sacrament of holy anointing. It was very, very touching. Even when I think about it now, I, it, I become emotional. And also I'm very private about it because, you know, she was in her bed, in her nightgown. Yeah, right. It was very, like, private, you know. And so I'm very careful even how I talk about it. But it was very modest, of course. But it was such a holy and private moment. And I anointed her. And, you know, that's a privilege for a priest to anoint a future saint. Right. That, there's a privilege right there. <laughs> I didn't deserve that. But I was so happy. Here, when I was a young monk, she anointed me, so to speak. Now she's old on her way out, and I anoint her. I'm given the grace to return the favor to this beautiful, saintly woman of God. How great God is. How great God is. Who could have orchestrated that? Who could have orchestrated that? Only God. And I would share with all my Hungarian brothers and sisters whom I love that everything good in your life, give glory to God. Don't take credit for anything good in your life. Nothing. All goodness comes from God. All. Never take credit. Never be a big shot. Always be a little shot. And give thanks to God for what he has done in your life and mine. He is beautiful. Our God is beautiful. And if every atheist in Hungary knew that, they'd be baptized tomorrow. If they knew how beautiful our God is. And I say, yes, my Lord, let everyone in Hungary, everyone be baptized soon. May Hungary fall in love with the one true God who alone is beautiful. What do you think can be, you know, you're, you're here from the United States and then we have Mother Angelica here in Hungary with us as EWTN, uh, the Hungarian office as EWTN. What do you think her, her example, her, her life, or even just, you know, whenever we listen to or watch the Mother Angelica's shows, what do you think her, her main message for the Hungarian people could be? I think Mother is trying to say to the Hungarian people, Hungary, she's trying to say, don't forsake the Lord. Don't forsake Jesus. Don't forget the God of your youth. We're in great danger of forgetting him, of forgetting God himself. It's almost like the church has fallen out of love with God. We need to fall in love with God. So I think Mother Angelica, she knows that Hungary is a pearl in the hands of the Virgin Mary. It's almost like Hungary is the pearl in Mary's crown. Mother knows that Our Lady loves Hungary and Hungary is in danger, you might say, of losing her pristine faith. And perhaps Mama, the Virgin Mary, and Mother Angelica sent me here today to set out a clarion call to reverse this. So instead of forgetting the Lord Jesus Christ and forgetting our true Catholic faith and forgetting the faith of St. Stephen and the great saints of Hungary, let's do the opposite. Let's begin remembering today that Hungary is completely gifted of God. This should be the happiest, most beautiful nation in the world. Don't forget that everything good comes from God. Everything good comes from Him. So perhaps Mother is sending me here today to call Hungary back to her roots, to be a humble but faithful nation, madly in love and joyfully in love with the one Redeemer, Jesus. You mentioned the youth today. And, you know, we here at EWTN Hungary, and I know that the e e entire EWTN family would love to launch programs and live shows for the youth. Would you be willing to, to support us in, in that way? And what do you think would be the, the true message today for in the 21st century for the young people of Hungary, of Europe, of the United States, of the Western world, and, it, and, in, and indeed for the entire world? Well, I tell you, it is a very, it's a difficult question. It's a quagmire. We're in a quagmire. We're in a swamp right now. Because you might say that other, other influences have stolen the hearts and the souls of our young people. And I remember when I was visiting Poland a couple years ago, and we had some beautiful, it was a pilgrimage, we had some beautiful tours through Krakow and other places of Poland 
uh, like Hungary, it's a very special nation. I mean, honestly, on the face of the earth, Hungary and Poland may be the two finest, most faithful nations in the world. Hmm. And as I was there observing things, I spoke to a, a young priest who was with me at the last day of the pilgrimage. And I said to this young priest, he was from Ireland, he said, you, I said, you know, Poland is an extremely beautiful country, and it's a holy country, but I fear for the future of Poland. He said, Father, why? I said, do you see all the beautiful young people everywhere we go, hundreds of them? Like, classes on their own special reports and missions with their classrooms and the museums and such, all these wonderful Polish teenagers. I said, did you notice? Every single teenager had a cell phone in their hand and they were watching it 24-7, wherever we went. I said, I fear in 20 years Poland will collapse unless this is stopped. So the cell phone and the things that are coming to our teenagers on the cell phone have become all-consuming. It's really become like an idol, an idol. And many idols are accessed through the phone. So we have a real great difficulty worldwide in that our children's hearts are being stolen right from underneath their parents' noses. Like the parents will pay for the cell phone that alienates the child from the parent. And I've been in many restaurants, I'm sure you have too, Dominic, and everyone watching at a nice restaurant. There's a table of teenagers over there, a wonderful time to have refreshment and, you know, to talk and conversation. None of them are talking. They're all on their cell phone and their food's getting cold. It doesn't make sense, <laughs> you see. It doesn't. And so we have a problem here with electronics. And the Virgin Mary, she did say to several mystics, saints, and prophets that she will return the whole world to a simpler way of life. There is a victory coming. Evil will not win. Evil will not win. Our Lord and Our Lady will win the day. It's been prophesied in several places approved by the church, and Hungary is part of this great prophecy. With the young people, we do have a difficulty here with the electronics. And it's necessary that the older ones pray and fast for God to give us a solution to this difficulty. It's become like they're everything, the cell phone. I do plan to work them. Um, I can't go into details right now, but I just spoke with um, a young musician here in Hungary who apparently is, I guess, the most acclaimed musician in the country. I'm not going to any details. I'm sure you know who it is that we're going to try to do a video interview together hmm. in a day or two to try to reach the teenagers through another teenager from Hungary. So in some way, we have to use the, the electronic media to go after the young people with the gospel. And that needs to be backed up by prayer and fasting. It's never a human initiative. When we, we work for the gospel, there has to be prayer and fasting behind it to make it effective. My friends are praying for us right now in the other room. Oh, I, I hope so. <laughs> well, Father Jim, if the world would end tonight, what do you think, what, what should we do? What, what should be the last thing? What should be the last action, the last words that we should say, that we should do, not just as Hungarians, but really every single Catholic, every single people on, on the face of this, this earth? Well, is kind of like the people of Portugal in 1917 at the last apparition of Our Lady where more than 70,000 people gathered to see if a miracle really would happen. And by the way, this is um, attested to historically, there were many Atheists and many communists were there to make fun of the Holy Catholic Church. They were converted on the spot. Every communist and every atheist and everyone else who was there, when they saw the sun not only begin to change colors and to spin and even to dance in the sky, but then the sun began to come towards the earth faster and faster. And the people knelt down and everyone thought it was the end of the world. I guess suppose that would be pretty logical to think it was. 
And they began to scream out to God to forgive their sins. And it was really funny when you read about it that many were confessing their sins out loud. They had not been to confession in years, so they had spoken it right out. Almost embarrassing, and yet very smart at the same time. What happened was people began to repent. And that old saying, I don't know if you have this one in Hungary, but they say that there's, there no, are no atheists on the battlefield. Boy, we're in a battlefield right now. But actually, every man has faith, including the communist. Either that or the Bible is lying. But the Bible says, let every man be proven a liar, but God be proven true. And the Bible says, every man has been granted a portion of faith. Every man. Every man. That means every communist as well, every atheist, everyone has a portion of faith. It's a question of acknowledging the truth that is already there. Acknowledging the truth that already exists. So if the world were to end today, I would say, Hungary, get down on your knees. If you have not loved God or worshipped him enough, do it now. Why? Because God is merciful. God is beautiful. One saint said, she knows that if she committed every mortal sin in the book, in fact, she said, if she herself, St. Therese, committed every sin that every human being had ever committed from Adam to the last man on earth, herself personally, and she went to God the Father through Jesus Christ and said, Father, forgive me in the name of Jesus. Therese said, God, the one true God, would not only forgive her completely, he would raise her up to a higher place than she had to begin with. This is the mercy and the greatness of our God. He doesn't just tolerate us. God esteems us. He loves us. So hungry, just get down on your knees even tonight. If you've been away from God, he's so beautiful. Just tell him that you're sorry and that you love him. He will not only forgive you for bringing you to a higher place than you ever had before, and one day he will bring you to a high place in heaven next to St. Stephen. That's what he will do. Our God, Dominic, forgive me for sounding a little bit brash here. God is not beautiful. God is beauty. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's not beautiful. He's beauty itself. God is not good. God is goodness itself. He's more than good. He is goodness. How blessed we are to be Hungarians, I'm informally Hungarian. <laughs> you are informally Hungarian. Yes, and how blessed we are to be Catholic Hungarians. May all of Hungary be filled with love for God and know what the fruit of love is? Joy. Joy. There we go. Amen. Well, Father Jim Blunt, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Thank you for, for coming, and thank you for coming back to Hungary. And, and please come back in the next months, years ahead. Thank you. I hope to come back. I, I love Hungary. And I'll be glad to come back. And I love the people, and I, I love the leaders of Hungary, the leaders of the government, and the leaders of the church. This is one special country. May all of Hungary become a nation of love and joy. May she not lose the gifts God has given to her, but rather may she remember the God who gave birth to her. Thank you so much. Thank you.